Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Marielle Villaray. I'm the Program Development Director for the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation at the Graduate Center and a proud partner with Copeland House on this series we call Underscored. Uh, we present these programs every fourth Monday at one o'clock and it's been a great run and we continue this through the summer. So I hope you'll continue to join us. Today, I'm so pleased to have our very own John Musto, faculty member at the Graduate Center and coordinator for music performance as our featured composer. And Michael Bariskin, the artistic and executive director for Copeland House will tell us more about the music and there will be a conversation following the performance for which you can submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom register of your Zoom window. So please do that at any time throughout the program and your questions and impressions will be brought into the conversation. We're so pleased to have you. Thanks for being here. And now I'll hand it off to Michael Briskin. Thanks, Mariel. I'm speaking to you on a beautiful day amidst the woods and the birds at the entry to Aaron Copeland's longtime home right behind me in New York's lower Hudson Valley. And we are so glad to be back with our friends from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York for another program in our underscored virtual series. And one of those great friends is the coordinator of the Graduate Center's doctoral program in performance, Professor John Musto, who happens to be one of the liveliest and most stylish and rewarding composers around. Today, we're featuring an eventful, action-packed trio for violin, cello, and piano that John wrote in the late 1990s. The piano trio is like many of John's works, which pull together all sorts of diverse musical strands and often explore extremes of character and texture. Even the trio's two movements set out that balance. The first movement has a nonstop, spiky, rhythmic energy that animates everything around it, whether that's long-lined melody or intricate counterpoint, which, by the way, is one of John's great musical passions. The second movement is very different and is itself bifurcated with two completely contrasting and alternating components. It begins amidst utter calm with wispy fragments tentatively intruding on silence. John once suggested imagining a guy improvising at the piano in a bar at 3 a.m. after all the customers had gone home. And then there's a complete break uh, and a quick cut to a jazzy, super caffeinated sprint. The Musto Trio takes us on a relatively short but really exhilarating journey, and we hope you'll have as much fun hearing it as we have playing it. My colleagues are music from Copeland House's principal violinist, Kurt Mackember, and guest cellist, Tom Cranus. And immediately afterwards, I'll be back with John to take your questions and hear your comments in a live Q&A after the credits finish scrolling. So before we hear music from Copeland House's performance of John Musto's Piano Trio, we've got John Musto right here with us to talk a bit about this piece and about music more generally. Um, John, I know you're gonna correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I thought it would be fun to talk a little bit about how you came to be a composer. And do I have it right that the route was maybe a little circuitous um, and started originally out of pop and rock? Wasn't your dad a, a guitarist? Fill me in, correct me. Well, uh, partially, he, yes, he was a jazz guitarist and we always had popular music in the house. We had uh, American Songbook, we had uh, uh, he played a lot of jazz. Uh, he had a trio that he played with, played the clubs. Uh, but we were also playing our, you know, my brother and I, my uh, older brother, uh, we had our piano lessons. We played our Beethoven sonatas and Chopin etudes and things like that. Um, and uh, we also played a lot of, spent a lot of time playing 
guitar also, um, and a lot of popular music, yeah. But um, I didn't really start, uh, I, I did not study composition. Um, I got into composing in my 20s. I, based, I took, you know, a, a bachelor's and master's degree in performance in piano from Manhattan School of Music. And so, the, I mean, the 20s is is fairly late. So what was the what was the impetus for that? Uh, I, I suppose I got into it. Uh, well, I was always improvising and because uh, that's what you do in pop music. Um, and. I guess the first things I wrote were songs because I was just really, I read a lot of poetry. And um, so there were certain poems that really uh, uh, appealed to me. I also was working with singers uh, uh, playing uh, the song repertoire, among other things. And um, so I started with songs because they're, you know, you're just dealing with a singer and a pianist. They're easy to program. And um, you've got the words to, you know, as a kind of scaffolding, maybe for 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 the music. Yeah, there is a yeah. There's a there, there's a a roadmap there. Yeah. And so you never really took composition lessons. No, never had a composition lesson. Which is extraordinary to me because I mean there are there are composers around who are, what should we say, more, more literate than others, well-studied, well-educated. And one of the things that my colleagues and I have always found about your music and found so rewarding is how, um, really how musically literate it, it is and how sophisticated it is. So, I mean, how do you know? How do you teach yourself to to write, uh, especially to that kind of level of? I mean, forgive me for calling it erudition. That level of erudition. I mean, that's you know, to me, that's um, that's even more extraordinary. We we did a program in this series where we featured um, the rather remarkable um, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century woman, uh, Amy Beach who, because of the conventions of the time, um, was not encouraged to be a composer or a pianist. And she was self-taught. I mean, she taught herself by reading uh, counterpoint uh, textbooks and you know, theory, theory treatises and just studied all kinds of music, even to the point of writing out, you know, taking Beethoven symphonies or quartets and writing out the music. So what, you know, what was your, what was your self-education like? Well, I, my education was being a performer and a pianist. When you, when you play a Beethoven sonata, it's your job to uh, take it apart, put it back together, put it on stage and figure out what makes it tick. You play Beethoven, you study with Beethoven. You play Carter, you study with Carter. You, you, whatever it is you're playing is kind of seeping in and, and you, uh, you, need to, you need to figure out what makes it tick in order to put it on stage. And uh, there's no composition lesson better than that. Uh, for sure. And, and I mean, there's also a big jump, it seems to me, from um, within that kind of self-education and starting from a point of, of uh, uh, coming out of the, the world of, of vocal music and voice and piano to um, that place of what I've always thought of as the, the, the highest level of musical accomplishment and erudition, which is exploring counterpoint and instrumental interplay. And of course, this brings, brings us back to the, the featured work today, the piano trio, which seems like 
you know, it's an example of musical counterpoint on steroids. Um, so how do you make that, I mean, that jump? I mean, that's kind of, of the acme of musical puzzle making in a way we, we, where all of the parts need to be fitting together. Well, uh, I don't know if I have an answer for that. It's, it's, I, I've always thought contrapuntally and uh, I'm always actually as a pianist, I'm always thinking about the orchestra. Um, it's not just fingers on, 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 on the keyboard. It's everything, you know, there's instruments, different voices are in there, instruments playing things. Uh, you know, you could imagine a clarinet playing this line and a, uh, this particular section goes to the strings and uh, uh, I've, uh, one of my favorite things is playing Bach. I, I really enjoy it more and more. My, really all I'm really interested in now is playing Bach in uh, 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 American Songbook. Um, That's two extremes in a way. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a musical conversation is, is, is what, 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 you know, the, the trio is it's the three people batting around the same ideas. I assume that you had a roadmap uh, in your, in your mind about the piece. Actually, no, this, okay. this, no. this piece, I mean, I know there are composers who plot out, uh, plot out their roadmap of this is going to happen and that's going to happen and um i'm really not like that and when this I, I remember this piece just started out as an improvisation i was just that opening piano figure i was just playing around with it um and we should just say that an improvisation is um you know for those who don't think about that uh about what that is i mean you're basically composing spontaneously at an instrument, correct? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Or at least just uh, investigating, playing around with ideas and- um, Call that making it up as you go along. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, this piece I actually just started at the beginning and wrote till the end. And wherever I was just suggested what the next thing should be. Which is really interesting to hear because, you know, the sense of inevitability of the way this piece flows from moment to moment and from section to section and beginning to end is rather remarkable. And the, I have to say that the sort of formal mastery, and again, this struck me uh, as much this last go around with this piece more, more than ever before, the, just the formal mastery of how these sections, uh, you know, sort of fit to, into each other, whether it's a surprise or something feels completely logical is, is pretty remarkable. And it's one of the joys of, of this piece. Well, I, well, all I can say is that when you've played a lot of music, um, you just have a sense of form. Um, and it, it's, it's just something that you, you sense and you don't, sometimes you don't actually have to plot it out and think about it. it, it it's just part of you. you. You just think that way. Well, it, it's a sense of theater, a kind of sense of, of, of instrumental theater it's, it seems to me where one has a sense of, of the pacing and, and the drama and um, it's all in this really dynamite piece um, it's it's eventful uh, there's a lot going on it's not a huge piece in terms of of uh, the, the time frame uh, but there's a lot going on and it's exciting and wonderful and we're thrilled to, to play it again. Um, we're gonna hear it now. And uh, as always, please stay with us uh, for 
a live Q&A. Um, we'll be happy to take all of your questions uh, after we hear the fabulous uh, piano trio from the late 1990s. Boy, that sounds like a long time ago, from the last century by the equally fabulous John Musto. John, thanks for doing this. Thanks for being here and, and for the conversation. Um, everyone enjoy the, uh, this terrific piece and uh, we'll see you at the end. Thanks. Thank you.
Well, uh, we have to catch our breaths for a moment. Um, and um, we're going to start with the usual housekeeping. Uh, first, a reminder uh, for all of you to please send in your questions and to do so by using the nifty Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're eager to hear from all of you. Second thing is um, this program is being recorded uh, in case anybody wants to um, catch it again uh, as soon as the Graduate Center closed captions this program. It will be posted on um, 
a Copeland House playlist on the Graduate Center website. Uh, so you can enjoy this extraordinary piece again and also tell all of your friends who may have missed it what a terrific piece they have missed. Uh, and the last thing is that the Graduate Center will also send out a um, very brief survey. Uh, we really want to hear from you. Um, it uh, always is interesting to us to get your thoughts. Um, and it'll help guide us as we continue programming uh, this fabulous series and uh, crossing the American musical landscape. Um, so we spoke with uh, John before uh, the performance and now we're really lucky to have um, my wonderful friends who took us on this bracing adventure uh, together, uh, Kurt Mackenberg and uh, Tom Cranus. Um, so guys, um, I think I'll start um, while we're waiting for questions to arrive. Um, so this piece, the, the Musto Piano Trio is really all music by which I mean um, he uses all 88 keys of the piano. Uh, there are no electronics, uh, no special effects. Um, he's basically using the same notes as Bach and Mozart and Brahms and uh, uh, all of the other great and not so great composers over the past few centuries. Uh, John, I think is way too modest when he says, um, uh, oh, you know, he just sits down at the piano and he has studied the great repertory of the past. Uh, he's interested in what makes music tick um, so maybe Kurt, um, well, both of you, Kurt and, and Tom, you guys have played about as much music as anyone I've known or had the pleasure of working with. What do you think makes this music tick? Oh boy. Um, you know, I had not heard the introduction before, so I did not realize that John claims at least that he was, had no composition uh, training. And as I listened, I tried to listen to through the piece in, with that in mind this time. And I, it was astounding to me, um, especially the form, the general form of both movements, how, as you were saying, Michael, at the beginning, the, this inevitability of what's coming next. He, he, he will, for instance, repeat a figure just the right number of times, build up some excitement. And uh, then we, we're into this other world. Um, it, it's just so natural um, and, and makes such sense. So I, I'm amazed um, at 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 his ability to do this with, with you know, but as also he's a he is a, a an accomplished performer too. So I, you know he has played a lot of music and knows knows how to make how to make a, a piece work. Uh, well, we're all accomplished. Well, I'll, you guys are accomplished performers. I try my best. We we we've all played a lot of music. Uh, I I I couldn't do that as a composer. I I don't know about about you guys. Um, that's uh, one of the many reasons I think John is being so modest about this and just um, what I had the same impression that, um, you know, oh, he talks about, you know, one moment, one moment leading to the next, but then it, that doesn't always add up with a lot of composers into yeah. that kind of uh, structural, um, command and sense of theater. Maybe it has something to do with John being, a, you know, a, a really, really accomplished uh, opera composer um, who really has a strong and tight sense of um, just pacing, you know, the theater of, of music. Uh, Tom, did you have anything to add about, about how this music, uh, how does this, how does the music tick for you? Um, it ticks very well. I think uh, um, it, it was interesting, as Kurt was saying, to listen to it with the in, in my keeping in mind what, what John had just been saying about his um, his background as a composer and his experience. I think that for me, listening to it, it just makes so much sense, and I can actually see how um, 
uh, he's he's trusting his seems to me he's trusting trusting his innate musicianship to to create the form and everything happens when it needs to happen. I sometimes feel like with composers uh, who who have gone to school longer for composition that there's there's this thing where you can say okay well I can see why this has to be there I can understand the theoretical basis for it but it's hard to make it work musically it's hard to make it feel like you say like a piece of theater like a narrative and I think with this piece not that it was easy by any means to play but the the events as they happened just they, they seemed right you know they, it, it didn't seem to I didn't feel like we had to sort of twist things around and, and, and bend over backwards in order to make something work. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a, a question uh, here from um, our friend Norman at the Graduate Center, uh, also a wonderful, wonderful pianist himself. Um, so he asks, particularly in the last movement, did, did we all develop a narrative to navigate through the rapid mood changes? <laughs> Who wants to who wants to take that, Tom? Well, we didn't discuss it. I imagine we all kind of did subconsciously. I don't know uh, because yeah, you're right. I mean, it goes particularly. I'm thinking of that really wonderful moment where things are building up in the fast tempo, and then there's this big crescendo, and then we suddenly find ourselves in the de -da 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 -de -da, the the slow beginning, but in this climactic way. Um, I don't think I had a specific story but that's just such a such a great moment as you say theatrically that um i couldn't tell you exactly what i was thinking but it was there was a narrative yeah i mean um you know this music is not intentionally um programmatic in that it doesn't have extra musical references or illusions, particularly. And so uh, for me, you know, the, my narrative about this really comes from the notes. And that's one of the things that makes not only this piece, but everything else that, that John has written so uh, vivid is that this is the story that's told, if we could put it that way, is through the notes and following sort of the passage of, of, of the notes. I do have to say that, uh, you know, John, uh, I remember early on when I was playing this piece, maybe it was before we recorded it, um, you know, and I was trying to get a sense of the beginning of the slow movement, so spare and quiet. And John came up with this image, which, I've never forgotten about, oh, he, you know, just think of the, the guy in the piano bar, uh, you know, sitting down at the piano and improvising and all the customers have gone home and it's 3 a.m. and they're closing up and cleaning up and he's got a cigarette dangling from his, his, uh, his mouth. And um, that image always stayed with me. And he talked about this sort of like a musical noir movie you know, with a couple walking down, a, you know, a rainy city street or something like that. I mean, um, there's an illusion for you. Um, and it was, it certainly helped me, you know, sort of ground it, but I think John didn't have that particularly in mind. And I think the music just carries us through, um, through what ought to happen. Um, there's another question from uh, Donald who asks about the biggest technical challenges uh, for us in bringing the piece to performance level. What do we think about that? This, this piece wasn't particularly easy to put together. <laughs> no, I, I found one, one of the challenging areas in, in the first moment when we are playing the, the, the fast section and, and, and the, the beat keeps getting shifted and and very and in the three parts at different times. So you know, keeping a sense of your own line, your own meter, but you're hearing two other people in in their own in different meters, but it has to all fit very squarely and very neatly together. Um, I found that to be to be a challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of there are a lot of special challenges 
in in this piece. Uh, and we don't want to get on the one hand, we don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but on the other, we often have composers <clears throat> with us. Um, you know, we were talking with John beforehand about how a piece comes together, how a composer puts a piece together, but we've maybe spent less time in this series um, talking about how performers put a piece like this together. And so I appreciate this, this question. Um, I mean, we talked a lot about counterpoint, um, certainly in the, in the chat with John beforehand and his passion for, for that, um, there is sort of two extremes going on in this piece, because on the one hand, there's a lot of counterpoint and there's a lot of thing, different things happening at the same time, but sort of a little bit, a little bit out of sync, intentionally out of sync with each other. So what, um, Tom, what happens in those sections? Um. There's, there's a lot of internal one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, go. Um, uh, the, the, well, I'm thinking of, of even just the very beginning. So I, I would say what the, the first thing uh, that any of us do is we look at the music, we look at the score and think, okay, got to practice that, got to practice that, got to figure. And then also for for Kurt and I, who aren't looking at the whole score, you know, the, the, the violin and cello part are just a the part, then we, we consult the score and make sure that we know what's going on in the other parts while we're doing our difficult thing. And so right at the beginning, Michael, at the beginning of the piece, you're playing one pattern in your right hand and another in your left hand. And basically one can think of it as that your right hand is going what, th uh, two thirds of the speed of the, of the left hand. And if I start listening to the wrong hand, then I'm gone. And that happened, I think, the first few times we played it through. And I also happened to know that I was in rhythmic unison with Kurt. So uh, I pretended that I knew what I was doing and just tried to change notes when Kurt changed his notes. And I'm not sure whether you guys noticed, but by the time of the recording, I was better. That's funny. I thought I was doing the same with you. <laughs> we're, not supposed to, we're not supposed to reveal those secrets. Oh, I thought that's what we were doing. OK, sorry. We can, we can cut that part out. Um, <laughs> Uh, probably not, but you're stuck with it. Um, <laughs> the, we call those things lifelines, yeah. the lifelines. The other extreme of the, maybe especially the string writing, you've got so many passages of that kind of independence. On the other hand, there are a number of passages where John treats the both strings as a unit and you're both playing exactly the same notes, or maybe at the same notes an octave apart, at the same time. So, Kurt, what about those? Those are different challenges, aren't they, than playing your own part? Well, certainly. I mean, it's, it's playing playing a string instrument. Eighty percent of your attention is is on intonation so much of the time. Um, well, it's not only the you know intonation, but but blend. We try to find. A way, a, a way to balance the voices that 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 sounds sounds full and 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 convincing, um, that, and you know that's one of the challenges, especially being in the group, not really knowing uh, from the outside how this all fits together. We get a sense after many years of doing this, but uh, it's it's um, it it takes rehearsing and of course listening very carefully. Yeah, I mean, there's a nice comment. Um, that Ken has made here, more of a comment than a question, which picks up on something that John said in, um, in the chat beforehand, um, which I liked as well. And he talks about John Musto is a first rate John Musto rather than a second formally trained, formally trained composer by someone else. And he particularly uh, cites John's range of Bach to the American songbook uh, that he mentioned beforehand. I was struck by that. I mean, knowing John as I do, I, I'm, yes, I'm aware of his um, love of counterpoint, but also the American songbook, um, both of which he plays inimitably. Um, and we get some of the, we get a lot of that don't we, in, in this piece. Tom, um, 
the counterpoint and the lyricism. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, regarding the American Songbook, I was thinking, you know, I think there's a, a bit of it in this piece as well in the, the divertimento, which we were listening to before, um, a little bit of before the, uh, the performance started. Which you um, recorded with us. Yeah, yeah. And I can remember when we were recording that and playing it for, for John, um, put the, some of the section that, that, that was being played, um, uh, you know, it sounds a little like West Side Story, you know, it has a little bit of that jazz thing, but also uh, uh, the composer Raymond Scott, which people might not be familiar with as a name, but everybody's heard his music if you've watched Bugs Bunny cartoons. He wasn't actually the composer, but the composer Carl Stalling lifted a lot of stuff for Raymond Scott. So in particular, if you watch a Bugs Bunny cartoon in which there's a machine, you'll hear this Raymond Scott piece called Powerhouse, which, um, and I think I, I, I believe I mentioned that to, to John and said, you know, there's, there's a little Raymond Scott. He says, I was listening to Raymond Scott the whole time I was writing this piece. So, uh, um, so that's another part of the American songbook that he's, uh, um, Exactly. And actually, it's funny because John and I have played a lot, believe it or not. Um, um, one of those novelty numbers that Ray Scott wrote for the cartoons, um, maybe he didn't write it originally for the cartoons, but um, it was probably Ray Scott's either good luck or bad luck, depending on how you see it, that it uh, ended up being appropriated for use in cartoons, but it was a piece, a little jazzy number from the, from the 1930s called Powerhouse. Mm -hmm. which, uh, as, as you said, Tom, uh, if you don't know the name of the composer of the piece, you've uh, undoubtedly heard the music. And uh, we did this in an arrangement that a very young Leonard Bernstein uh, created for four hands, piano four hands or two piano four hands. And um, yeah, it's a dynamite piece and it's got that kind of spiky energy that, that John's music has. Um, we have um, maybe time for one more and there's an interesting comment here from Scott uh, who, a comment and a question, and it's a difficult question, so I'm not gonna answer it, but I'm gonna throw it out to one of you guys. Um, <laughs> Scott is always interested in how pieces of music work together in a program. Um, and he asks which pieces of music, whether by John or another composer, do we think best show off this trio? Which pieces, oh, this is multiple questions, but they're related. Which pieces match its intensity? intensity? Shostakovich, E minor trio or Rager? E minor trio, perhaps, or which pieces contrast well with it? <laughs> so there's a there, you know, there's a, a bundle of, of questions. Um, what do we think, Kurt? I'm not familiar with the Rager trio. I'm very familiar with the Shostakovich, and that does, inc inc of course, have this incredible range of music. I mean, as far as programming, though, you want to put together. Um, pieces that are not similar, that, that uh, explore different avenues, uh, different styles, different um, moods. And so, you know, I, I don't know that I would necessarily program shows to go between this piece, uh, but I don't know, I need, need more than one minute to think about this one. <laughs> Tom, you got any thoughts about that? I, I would agree, I, I wouldn't, I, 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 to me, the Shostakovich would 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 pull the program in a in a. I mean, I can I can definitely see the similarities, but they would pull the program in a certain sort of serious direction. And I could imagine uh, finding a, a Haydn trio that um, that uh, that that would s it, just just the the inventiveness and humor. In a way, Haydn's the composer that I would um, that I'd be interested. I, I think that could illuminate something about both of these pieces, um, even though, of course, there would be lots of dissimilarities. Yeah, I would agree, too. I mean, I would put the Shostakovich very, very much in the category of contrasting uh, rather than aligning. Um, yeah, the Shostakovich trio, I mean, it's obviously one of the great, great chamber works in the, in the repertory. Uh, and it has 
immense intensity, but it's of a very, very different kind of intensity than John's piece. Um, you know, for me, the Shostakovich trio is blood curdling in a way. I mean, it was written in, you know, during the, the depths of the Second World War in the early 1940s. And it's kind of suffused I think as a memorial uh, piece uh, for the dedicatee, who was a very close friend of, of uh, Shostakovich, um, a, apparently a formidable violinist, as well as a polymath, a rather amazing polymath. And uh, there's all kinds of allusions, speaking about a composer who is constantly alluding to all kinds of other, other uh, things. Um, outside of the, the, the four walls of the piece of music, um, alluding to, you know, the cataclysm that was all around, uh, all around Shostakovich and the Russian people uh, during, the, during those years of the, the Second World War. So I, I'd certainly find that a very different kind of, um, very different kind of, of piece. And in terms of uh, programming, I mean, this gets into a whole other question which we, uh, you know, it's worth a, a whole other conversation about how um, we program today and how programming has so, I think, changed in really fundamental ways. Uh, I can only speak for how um, Copeland House programs, and we tend to try to, um, for our, what used to be our live, concerts and what we hope will again be our live concerts, we tend to try to um, bundle pieces of music together under a kind of thematic umbrella. And, um, you know, that starts to bring in all kinds of other issues about, uh, about programming that build from the nature of, of individual pieces. Um, but as I say, that's a, that's a conversation for another time. Uh, for now, I want to thank all of our viewers for joining us and staying with us on this um, really exhilarating uh, journey uh, that John has, uh, has, um, has crafted for us. Um, and thanks to uh, my good friends, uh, uh, Kurt and, and Tom. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with them. The good news is that they and I will both be back uh, for our next concert in this underscored virtual series. Uh, remember always that it's the fourth Monday of every month. Um, this one again is at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we have another um, really exciting trio. Um, from the same year, actually, interestingly enough, 1998, um, with the same performers, um, and Pierre Jalbert, who is one of America's uh, most gifted uh, composers. Uh, we've got the um, piano trio number one uh, of, uh, of Pierre Jalbert. Uh, he wrote it when he was an up and coming 32 uh, year old uh, composer. Uh, and in the intervening years, he has been widely acknowledged as a chamber music master. Um, please join us. That is, just to double check the date, July 26th, the fourth Monday uh, in July. Uh, please, please come back. And um, thanks for joining us. We hope to see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.